So the, the pre-workshop prompt tonight, uh, how familiar are you with navigating civic engagement processes and systems during COVID-19? Uh, if you feel very familiar with this, go ahead and select the letter A or text the letter A. Again, the instructions are just at the top of this slide. If you are familiar, that's B. If you're not sure how familiar you are, that's letter C. If you are unfamiliar, that is letter D. And if you are very unfamiliar, with navigating civic engagement processes and systems during COVID-19. That is the letter E. And let's go ahead and see here. All right, so fairly even spread, definitely tilted towards the unfamiliar side of things. Um, a lot of folks feeling not sure, um, but majority looks like unsure or unfamiliar. Um, so with that, I will pass it back over to Teresa. Uh, Teresa, you can control the slides with your remote and I will sign off until the end. Thank you, everyone. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, thanks everybody for being here. So today we're gonna talk about civic engagement in a COVID-19 world. And what we mean by that is how do you vote? How do you go to council meetings? How do you, um, navigate some of the systems that Michael talked about in the previous session with the neighborhood improvement, um, the draft of that resource directory. How do we navigate our city or in our community, uh, the engagement part of it, the civic engagement piece of it during COVID-19 and everything being virtual? So that's what we want to talk about today. And I'm going to introduce our panelists since um, it is 6.15, so let's go ahead and just get started. I'm going to introduce our panelists, and hopefully we have some good discussion. So I'm going to bring each of them up on the screen in a moment here. Uh, we have Quincy Murphy, who is a community advocate in Flint. Uh, spotlight. Oh, let me fix that real quick here. Okay, there we go. Uh, Teresa Springer, who is at Wellness Services. And then we have Isaiah Oliver, who's with the Community Foundation of Greater Flint. And Rennell Weathers from the Michigan League for Public Policy. So they are all our guests today, or tonight, and we'll be talking about civic engagement with them as our kind of our experts today. So I want to uh, go around since I've uh, already kind of said where you, who you are, and where you're from. But I'd like to go to each of you and ask about what is what kind of advocacy do you do, and then just kind of a fun question because we had a session about this a couple sessions back. Do you know what generation you're in, and what is it? Because I think that all uh, that may play a role in the fact that we are all doing virtual everything now. So um, let's. Let's go, let's go to Quincy. You're first on my screen. Do, would you like to unmute and share with folks what kind of advocacy you do? So like, what do you do in the community? Well, you know, um, I'm a community activist. Um, I'm also serving on the MTA Board of Directors and the City of Flint Board of Review, the Genesee County Land Bank Advisory Boards. Um, my advocacy, more geared towards blight elimination and preventative maintenance for our community and um, working specifically in targeted areas versus being all over the place. So if you don't see me all over the place, that's because I'm trying to make a significant impact in one particular area so that you can see an impact in the work that I do as far as um, advocacy and building capacity because um, even though I just said I, it's not an I, it's a we. Uh, and nothing we do in a community cannot happen without all of us working together. So a lot of my advocacy come with building capacity and working and connecting with others to um, troubleshoot, to figure out what's the best ways to tackle and target um, complicated issues in our community. Okay, thank you. Uh, Teresa, you're next on my screen. 
So hi, everybody. Um, Teresa Springer at Wellness Services. I'm the director of programs there. And um, my advocacy is really around um, inclusion, um, diversity and inclusion. And that would be for Black, Indigenous, um, Black, Brown, Indigenous people of color. And then um, secondly, it's around harm reduction, um, harm reduction um, for sexually transmitted infections um, like Hep C, like HIV and other STIs. Um, and then lastly, it would be around um, inclusion of LGBTQ plus people, especially LGBTQ plus people of color, especially trans women of color. Um, I like to uh, center voices that are not usually heard in the community and that are not recognized as um, valuable a lot of times. And so helping to center those voices and get them access to safe services, because a lot of times um, people that identify along the LGBTQ plus spectrum, um, people that are black, brown and indigenous don't have access to safe services in the community and that's social services and medical services. And then just like regular services, <laughs> like grocery shopping. <laughs> um, and I am Gen X a proud Gen Xer, even though I fall along that line of like Xennial, but like, I'm just like, is that even a real thing? Like, I feel like it's Gen Xers that were jealous of millennials. So they just like made up something to like fit in, but proud Gen Xer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, Isaiah, you're next on my screen. Thanks. I almost want to start at the bottom and figure out where Teresa is to figure out where I really am because I'm in that Zinio group and I don't know where to classify as an X or a millennial typically classify as X. So I'll start at the bottom by saying I'm a part of the group that's protecting all of the boomers from the millennials from getting canceled by the millennials. That's the group that I'm in. <laughs> but my name is Isaiah Oliver. I am president and CEO at the Community Foundation of Greater Flint. And I guess if we talk about the type of advocacy that I do, I think we do advocacy across the spectrum from political advocacy to non-political advocacy. So some things really focused on neighborhoods and making sure that we amplify the voices of residents or through, do authentic community engagement and really being thoughtful about being advocates as far as maybe even being lobbyists around early childhood education or K-12 funding or municipal finance. And so we do a little bit across the spectrum, but ultimately as a public charity, or a group, quite frankly, that take allows folks to get a tax deduction and has broad public support. We have over 31,000 donors and we have over 440 vo volunteers. Um, we're engaging residents throughout the process as we do our work. I'm looking forward to this conversation because maybe we can talk more about how that inter interacts or intersects with much of the work that Teresa and Quincy and Rennell is doing. All right, thank you. And Rennell. Hello, so good to be here uh, with uh, you all tonight. And uh, so I am with the Michigan League for Public Policy. We are a statewide organization. Um, and so our advocacy really is around policies that for children and families, right? So they, um, so you don't have, so a zip code doesn't, doesn't indicate how well they're doing, right? So what kind of policies do we put forth that open doors, uh, allow access and opportunities. Uh, so twofold, that's one thing that we do. But we also support uh, uh, work on the ground, right? So I do a lot of work with Flint organizations, helping be a thought partner on their advocacy efforts, either locally or statewide or federally. And also we provide uh, resources, fact sheets, materials for local organizations, uh, as, long, and long, and as well as we do training uh, for uh, the members and um, networks or uh, uh, organizations that are working, community activists who are working on the ground in communities across the state. All right, and then do you know your generation? I do, well, I well know my generation and uh, Isaiah kind of gave me a little shade there, but I'm, I'm a baby boomer. <laughs> um, gladly, gladly so, I'm, I'm, I'm on the bottom half of that, but probably so, and I support all other generations. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. And just for a fun fact, I am solidly a millennial. <laughs> I am 84, so I'm a, very much a millennial. Um, I also am an advocate and 
Uh, much like Quincy, I do advocacy for the neighborhoods and the folks that are here today. So I am gonna go on to the next slide, which just kind of begins our conversation. But what I wanna invite everybody in the um, who's here today and in the chat, I see a lot of people talking in the chat. Uh, what I wanna invite our participants today to do is to share their questions in the chat. And then if, um, if the folks from the planning team, Ashley and Karma, Michael, Sierra, if you guys would mind just sending me a direct message to let me know who's next as in terms of their question, or if you want to just uh, ask the question on behalf of them, that's fine as well. But um, we do have some planned questions, but if you guys have questions in the chat, we can ask your question because uh, we are here for you today and not for uh, Teresa. So we're just gonna start off with some questions just to get the ball rolling. But if the participants have questions, I'd much rather us ask those questions. So first, what I'd like to ask everybody, uh, and maybe this is, you know, this might be something, uh, I was thinking this might be a question for Quincy or Vernell, especially. Um, we know that civic engagement and advocacy are, are very important to getting things done and long-term change. But right now, since we're all in COVID and everybody's at home and you can't really go anywhere, how do we actually participate in this process in this COVID-19 world, and that might look different if you are advocating at a state level or if you're advocating at a neighborhood level, but I'm curious of, of how you are doing that right now. Uh, one thing is, is that in this, in, in advocacy and engagement is the same process wherever you're doing it, right? And so because, uh, and especially um, for local folks, they are really the voices needed at all levels uh, of engagement. Uh, but one thing is, is that because of COVID, it all like, you know, how do we actually touch, communicate with decision makers? Uh, I actually, I actually developed a, uh, uh, this fact, a sheet on a dozen ways to engage remotely for that reason, because decisions are being made whether we engage or not. They still, they still are being made. And so how do we actually, it didn't stop. And so one of the things is, was makes folks understand, we still have to educate folks. So remain educated and then also learning the ways that decision makers are now meeting. Are they on social media? You know, are they doing, you know, how are they connecting also because decision makers also are public figures. They want to connect with folks too. So find out ways they are connecting and then, you know, be there, join the virtual uh, coffee hours, you know, call it, you know, call up the offices, things like that. A lot of the offices were closed for a while. So social media was kind of the only way to meet. And uh, so joining those virtual meetings was really, really important. One of the things that, that I think a lot of times community folks don't remember that they are the experts right? They are experts, as equal experts as any PhD, because they understand the experts of their lives, experts of what's happening in community, of policy. And so it's really important that we continue to lift those voices up and actually hear those stories. And so um, ways of doing that is really, really important to, to do all of the above, right? Uh, you know, how, how, find out how decision makers are actually reaching out and then um, follow, follow up with, with them at every, every, every stage. All right, thank you. And Quincy, how are you um, doing it? How are you doing advocacy right now? How are you engaging with things? I know I would see you at all the public input, all the city things, like you were always at stuff. So I'm curious of how you're getting stuff done right now. Um, <clears throat> it kind of remind me of when one door closed, um, if the, the, they close the front door on you, come through the window. They close the window, come through the chimney. You know, just find different ways to navigate. Um, you know, they closed city council. Okay, I got a call on the phone now. Um, the MTA board meeting, um, we used to meet in person. Now we on the phone. So um, you just look at ways to do things different with um, Dewey Park. Um, I'm already out there picking up trash. So I'm not waiting um, until some funding come in or somebody donates trash bag you just going out there and do what you got to do and you just do things different you wear a mask um everywhere i go i have masks two three four just, just be on the safe side you know wherever i go i'm making sure because i'm taking i'm very um conscientious when it comes down to um the virus a couple of my friends and 
family have passed from that. So I'm mm-hmm. taking it very serious. I think other people should take it serious. Um, so I'm doing what I have to do. And when we have cleanups, we got one coming up on the 17th of this month. You know, we want to be able to have masks for our participants to be able to wear them when they come so they can feel safe. Um, I can feel safe. You can feel safe. Everybody that's coming, that you can feel safe. And then we're just um, practicing social distancing. We just got to do things differently. Don't mean we can't get it done. We just got to um, do it in a different way. So, yeah. Well, thank you. And I, I, Teresa and Isaiah, did you guys want to respond to this question as well? I know that the, the second question I definitely had in mind thinking of you two, you know, how has how has uh, COVID impacted the way that you advocate for the people that you serve or the people that benefit from your programs or from the foundation? Um, that was another way of, of just kind of thinking about it, because I know you know, Quincy and Rennell, some, you know, do more direct advocacy, but you guys do a lot of supporting people who need those advocates. And so I was curious of how has it impacted the work that you guys do? Um, so when COVID hit last year, um, we were monitoring the, I mean, we was, we were, we were like looking at things and like in January, it was just like, if this thing hits, it's going to hit and it's going to hit hard. And we need to figure out what we're going to do for our clients if that happens. Um, especially our syringe service clients, um, our syringe access clients, because they access our services weekly and it's in person. And legally, uh, we were kind of bound with doing anything um in a way that like in the mail or anything like that, like we couldn't do, we couldn't deliver naloxone in the mail and things like that. And so um, when, when the world shut down, we had shut down like two, three days before the world shut down. And we ended up moving our services um, from weekly to biweekly and just giving like a surplus of supplies. Um, we never ceased our case management services. It all went virtual. Uh, we, like like everybody, we went to Zoom. We got Zoom fatigue immediately. <laughs> um, and then uh, we had all of our staff work from home, except for the staff that had to come in the office um, every other week to serve our syringe access. We called the program STEP. And so for that, like we had to come in the office to do that. Um, the the hurtful thing for, of that, well, how can I say this? What hurt us the most is our LGBTQ plus drop-in center. Like that drop-in center, um, it was a LGBT, it is a LGBTQ plus and ally center. And we were able to move a lot of that online. Like we have a chill space online and we do movie nights and stuff like that. But what was taken away is um, individuals that um, are houseless or experiencing homelessness no longer had a place to come to during the day during COVID. Um, and that one hurt the most. And that that was really um, challenging to navigate. Um, and we're still having a really hard time navigating that one. Um, but what we did was we started putting people up into hotels with the help of like metro housing and different things like that. We started getting people housed. And we actually, um, over this past year, we've housed more people than we've ever housed before. <laughs> I, I think we were at like 28 people housed, which is huge because usually like we refer out and we don't do direct housing, but this is us directly working with them to get them housed. Um, and then food access became huge and um, it became a huge need for the community. So we started, we changed, we, we literally um, stripped our boardroom down and now it's a food pantry and we do weekly deliveries. We started out doing shipped and like the and like that was a hot mess because you know everything was a hot mess you know everybody took all the toilet paper everybody like they just uh, the the shelves was just like stripped but we still do that weekly and we have i think it's uh, we average like 13 people that we deliver food to every week and um that's across many spectrums from being HIV positive to ident- identifying um along the gender and sexuality spectrums um, and just being um, like somebody we need, like we don't, we don't like to turn away people. So like 
yeah, it's it was it was a mess, but we worked it out. And now, like we've op- we've reopened all our services. Case management is still done virtually. Um, we're t- we're doing our testing. We're doing our syringe services. We're actually back to weekly, and we added another day. So, yeah, it worked out. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, we did have we have a question from Leah um, in the chat. This is a for Teresa. This is a good question. Um, how did you get around virtual casework and technology access barriers? You know, do you have any? Uh, that yeah, is a really good question. Um, I what we did is we offered a buffet of options for clients. Um, so when when the world shut down, because that's what I call it, when the world shut down. <laughs> Um, we were lucky that a lot of our funders didn't have us. We didn't need to get signatures. And so we were able to move things virtually really easy. So we used Zoom and we used um, SurveyMonkey and we used um, like our phones and like everybody got a stipend to use their phone um, at home. And we just like reached out to clients. We created this, um, this I call it a COVID assessment. It was created in SurveyMonkey. And it basically, like all our case managers called our clients and did like this assessment that asked like, do you have access to technology? Um, Do you have access to a stable internet connection? And then one by one, we filled those gaps for people, whether it was like linking them to like, um, to to, like Comcast for that $8 a month. I forget how much it is a month, but like the, the, the internet service and stuff like that, or connecting people with the Obama phones or just like anything that we could do. We're just like resource hoarders at wellness. And so like, that's like that. I think that's our, like, that's our, um, our like shining thing that we do there. Like if it's a resource out there, we will find it and we will link it to you. <laughs> like, so yeah, we just did it like that. Cool. thank you so much. And then, uh, yeah, Isaiah, do you just, again, like how has this impacted like the folks that you work with and that you are, you know, there for to, to, that are doing this advocacy work that come to you guys for support? So first off, I'll say that Rennell and Quincy and Teresa have hit it. I mean, COVID-19 hit us like crazy. And I would say prior to COVID, innovation was a luxury, right? It was that thing that set you apart from everyone else. We'll tell you innovation was a necessity during COVID. If you weren't innovative, you didn't make it. And so what we don't know right now, most of our application processes were already online. We were already engaging with folks. What we don't know is how many folks we lost when we transitioned to being 100% um, offsite. So we do know that a lot of our neighborhood small grants um, uh, uh, applications would come through electronically, but we did have some that came through written. So we had to create a mailbox in the office that allow people to drop them and be picked up. But we do also know that everyone doesn't have access to technology. And so there was one major loss is that we lost the physical connections to folks. And so we always say that we need to do more, more social distancing. Quite frankly, we're socially engaging more than we ever have before in the history of the Community Foundation, but we're not physically engaging with anyone. So what we're doing more of is physically distancing. We're not touching people. We're not engaging with folks. We're six feet away from folks. We have our masks, just like Quincy, one, two, four, right? We, um, and, uh, you know, so that part of the process is what's the challenge for us. We don't get the walk-ins that we would typically get. We don't get to answer the questions that a person had because they happen to be downtown taking care of, care of any number of errands and they dropped into our office and asked a question. You've got to set up a meeting. And you know how Zoom is. Zoom, you can't just pop into someone's meeting and say, I was trying to see if you were busy or not. I see that you're not. Let's talk. Right. You got to plan that out. And so with so much planning and so much social engagement, I will tell you from an advocacy perspective, we're able to advocate for the people of this community in ways that we never have been before. There were times where I would have to travel to D.C. to talk about what what's happening in D.C. and how it impacts the Flint and Genesee County community. I can be on a conference call in D.C., the early part of the morning, I can be in LA later on in the evening and I can have 10 community meetings that might or might not have happened today. 10 community meetings in between, all in spaces where we're advocating for the best in, in the best interest of the folks in this community. And so that didn't happen before. And that's a benefit. But I will tell you, we're not really sure what the opportunity cost is just yet. And so um, <laughs> Teresa said earlier, things are a hot mess and there's no toilet paper. I just can't get that out of my head. That sounds terrible. <laughs> 
<laughs> a hot mess and no toilet paper just doesn't go well together. But I think what we're learning right now is we're curving or coming out of this hole, right? While we still continue, need, we need to continue to utilize our best thinking as we're engaging with folks, um, that we have to make sure we figure out what of this travesty we want to take with us moving forward. And part of it is what we've learned by engaging with one another socially, utilizing the technology that is boom. I mean, I think they said that Zoom was like up 4,000%, right? Before we were wrestling with being on the phone and having all those different phone numbers and trying to figure out who was who. We have to figure out what we take of this Zoom, this Zoom, this virtual world and move it forward. I think it'll be an amazing asset for us, making sure that people who haven't had seats at the table, as we're talking about authentic community engagement, this is another way to ensure people who haven't had a seat at the table have a seat at the table. Because before you had to be able to physically be there or be invited to be in the space. Now I can just send you the Zoom link with the code, right? So there were, we're eliminating some of the barriers to including people in processes that impact their lives. And so I love where we're going as long as we utilize it appropriately. Thank you so much. I love that you, you mentioned that because I do ask on the next slide, um, I do ask a couple questions that are very much related to what you were saying. Um, and one thing I wanted to just check with Ashley, she's keeping an eye on the chat for me. Ashley, do we have any other questions that are coming in? Just yeah, we just had one question come into the chat. How are you helping senior citizens enter the new world of Zoom meetings? Yeah, that's something that that I think is very interesting because it's, I mean, we know from Neighbors Changing Flint, there's, I'm sure that some of our participants probably would say like before having to do this all virtually, they, they might not have thought that they could have done it this way. So I'm very curious of, of that, how you guys might have experienced that. Something that we've done is we've set up like Zoom consultations where, because our office is open and um, we've done things like we have UV lights in our labs and we have like air filters in the rooms and we have N95s and face shields and, you know, giving people access to that. But we'll set up um, a Zoom consultation for our older clients that don't really know how to navigate um, technology and bring them in and sit them down and kind of like do a run by run. And something that we were thinking about doing that has not been done. So anybody that wants to do this, I encourage you to do this is um, to set up a document in very much like readable third grade language, like step A, click the link. <laughs> step two, hit open Zoom, you know, something like that. We haven't done that, but we have done those walkthroughs and they've been really helpful with clients, especially um, for clients that need to access um, doctor appointments and, and different things like that because our um, clients are medically fragile. Well, a lot of them are, not all of them. Yeah. That's yeah, good. and Teresa, to that point, I do think that, um, is it Flint Innovative Solutions that Athena McKay has been mm -hmm. working with? So they've done some Zoom um, consultations. I think most of those are done virtually, but I do think they may have done some in person as well. And I think they do have that document where it goes, where it provides step-by-step -step instruction. Um, so Teresa, I, Teresa Springer, I think um, Teresa or myself can get you in touch with uh, Athena McKay so that you have access to that document for the folks that you serve as well. I was just thinking about that. And then just like a shout out to our own Zoom uh, helpers, <laughs> uh, Michelle and Sierra, who have been, you know, there for people to, to just call and say, hey, I'm trying to do Neighbors Change in Flint. How do I do this? So you guys, I mean, that's, I love that people are willing to do that personal touch now because it's, it's so important. But does any, has anybody else had any um, suggestions around how do we engage people who maybe have never used this kind of technology? I think that's the biggest thing is having somebody who can sit down with you and go over it. Um, and it's pretty, you know, it's pretty fun. My my 87 year old grandma got to see one of her uh, one of her nieces grandkids on Zoom, and she never thought she'd be able to. I mean, she never thought she'd be able to do it. And I was there and helped her do it. And she's like, "Wow, this is amazing." So it's those kind of things have been um, impacted as well. But um, 
So, so Isaiah kind of talked about this a little bit already, but what are the the challenges that you've encountered? And then what are some of the successes that you might, uh, that you might've seen or the things you might've learned through this experience? Um, is there anything that you would want to keep from, from this experience? Yeah, I know I talk a lot. So, <laughs> so I'm like, I'll see the group. I'm like, my turn. <laughs> but you know, I, I think Isaiah said it earlier with um, being able to be in Washington, D.C. at like 10 a.m. and in New York at 11. Like, I, I like the global engagement that we've been able to do. Um, I recently was a part of South by Southwest and that was a global conference and it was it was really cool. I was really sad that I couldn't travel to it, but like that's another story. But like I would love to keep like that part of it, being able to have these meetings um, more accessible to people and being able to, you know, not have to drive to Detroit for an hour meeting and then come back and like waste those two hours in that drive and actually be able to fill those two hours. Cause I swear I get more work done now that we're virtual than I do than I did before when I was in everybody office, but my own. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have things that, that maybe really challenge you and think in creative ways that you maybe worked around that? I think one of the issues Keisha that, that, um, I had was how do you support partners, right? We're used to going to I'm sure, meetings all the time. So how do you actually go then do those? So, and then some of our community partners didn't have access to the virtual meeting tool. So we actually supported our partners by giving them our access until they kind of could grow and, and, and get their own. So that was one way that, that, that we found. And then it was, I think Teresa Hill, no, we're able to attend so many more meetings because I would spend I probably was driving, you know, a lot, you know, around around towns, and so to do it virtually really became we were we were able to successfully right really build our network of organizations we were supporting. Uh, but then the other part is how many should you do? <laughs> then you usually you had an hour drive time between some meetings, and you would like okay that's your time to recuperate, think through whatever. But you would have like okay one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, you know. So I actually learned to have, make sure that you take care of self and build in some time for lunch, you know, and, and to be able to, to think and, and things like that. So also understanding expectations and managing those expectations uh, were a couple of things that were clear, but the ability to, and, and actually for meetings, more people showed up, you know, I mean, usually you may have had 20, 30%, we had like 80% people, you know, Showing up, so the attendance was was better at some of our our trainings and meetings and things um, for that. Um, and then to so so one thing about it is to what pieces some of some of those are going to become hybrids. So I think we're always going to have some virtual pieces of the work. Um, I think it's important to understand that. But also the in person things, whenever it gets back to that, because as as Isaiah mentioned, some folks you can't reach, some folks you you miss out, miss you 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 lose right. You'll make sure that you can be as, as, as inclusive as possible, equitable as possible to have all of that. I do want to say that as far as successes, um, what we've learned also is that leveraging relationships is really, really important. And so continue building those relationships. So even though you're remote, how do you still stay in touch, right? How do you still communicate? So all those social media, all those ways of touching folks, you know, call and drop a note, you know, I would mail things to folks, you know, people had got business before the snail mail became a real issue late last year <laughs> before that I was um you know some of that mail those something to folks um um for that you know to, to stay connected um but one thing we did find was uh criminal justice reform was a huge was was really a success as far as policy um over uh, through this this last year and that was totally we didn't, didn't think that was happening at all usually you find some wins budget but the expungement issues you know, getting, you know, so having those relationships, continuing those that, that work uh, really paid off. So there was a lot of successes for us in community criminal justice reform, which, which really uh, mm -hmm. helps all, all communities. Thank you for that. Um, Teresa, I've got a, a question in the chat for Quincy. Um, so Leah asked, Quincy, how are you getting together volunteers and help with cleanups right now? Um by giving people a sense of belonging 
um, I do a lot of delegating. And when you do that, people feel a part of. So um, I can say my neighbor across the street on Damon Street, she's going to coordinate with Keep Genesee County Beautiful to pick up all the bags. Um, Miss Charlotte Miller, she's doing the food. Um, I can think of um, Linnell Jones and them up at the Sylvester Broom Center. They're going to be responsible for um, working on the um, baseball diamond up at Dewey Park. Um, and I'm so excited. Um, starting May 1st, they want to be starting a um, youth baseball league at Dewey Park. And it kicked right. off on May the 1st. So we that's how we end up having our cleanup early. So I, I do a lot of bringing people in because when you bring people in and you get them a sense of belonging, it makes it much easier for me. And um, word of mouth, um, Facebook, people keep coming back. I don't know sure how it's going to be this year being the COVID. Um, people very um, cautious about being around people, but I just believe because they love Dewey Park and they love Love the community so much. I don't have enough volunteers to do what we need. One of my concerns is the neighborhood engagement hub. I don't know if it's open to the public. Usually, we will go and reserve some tools up there, so that may be a challenge for us to um, have access to tools. So, uh, since neighborhood engagement hub is on, uh, Ashley, do you have any updates about neighborhood engagement hub? Yeah, so our our hope at this point in time, which one of one of NEH's biggest challenges during COVID has been the need to constantly pivot. I think we were getting ready to open at least three or four times last year before we then had to change course just because of the numbers. Um, our hope at this point is to open on April 12th. Um, that's assuming that we remain stable. So, you know, it really depends on where COVID numbers are and, and where state regulations are at that point. Um, but the way that we're going to be uh, issuing equipment out to folks is going to be different than it has been in the past. So assuming that we are able to open, everything has to be done by appointment. So we're not doing any walk-up service and it would be curbside pickup only. Um, and there will be like delegated time slots for folks. So there will be a morning time slot and an afternoon time slot so that our team has uh, time uh, between those times when the equipment comes in to sanitize everything very thoroughly before it then goes back out into the community. Um, and Quincy, I will share that information with you about what that process looks like. Um, I will make note of that right now to get that over to you. Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, that's been uh, an ongoing thing that we've been trying to figure out as board members with with the team, um, with the team as well. One of the things that I, I thought was interesting about the challenges of being everything's virtual and everybody, the world shut down, like Teresa Springer likes to say, the other Teresa likes to say, um, <laughs> and me and me and Teresa call each other the other Teresa all the time. Um, one thing that I thought was as an advocate for what I do, um, I, I think that it's interesting because if I want to go to city council meetings now, I can listen to city council meeting at home while I'm walking around cleaning my house, while I'm getting other stuff done. And so if that meeting lasts to 1130 at night, I'm at home instead of sitting in those uncomfortable chairs at the dome. Um, so that's one thing I thought was kind of like, hey, that's, I like that. I like being able to be at home while I'm uh, listening to these meetings instead of having to go there. Like Renell said, it takes a lot of time to drive back and forth to things. And it you all know it takes a lot of time to, to sit through uh, city council meetings in, in Flint. Um, one of the other things I wondered about um, is this that being everything being virtual has really made me more mindful about accessibility, uh, you know, providing things for people who um, need need visuals or don't have a visual and being able to remembering to say okay we, this is a question for Quincy this is a question for so and so so that if somebody is is um blind or just doesn't have a computer they know who's about to speak next um 
So I was just curious if you guys have had any of those kind of um, any of those kind of experiences. Like I say, I don't know if you guys have had any any things that you guys have changed or done differently just to make sure things are accessible. I'm just curious about that. So, so we haven't made a lot of changes in that space. I will tell you that we're doing this shakeup or this, I would say, what, one thing that we're leaving in 2020 is this belief that there is a new normal coming, right? Like back to normal doesn't exist anymore. We're going to have to co-create a future together. So both on the internal front and external and how we engage with community and more specifically how we advocate on behalf of community, we're going to have to co-create what that looks like all over. Like it's a new thing. It's not getting back to, to, the, to normal anymore. And so as a result, we've been thoughtful about a few things. I mean, we were doing physical checks, cutting lots of physical checks every year. We, we cut very few little um, checks. Now, that was a shift that could have happened years ago, but we, we didn't have the motivation right, to make that move. Right now, we're doing a whole lot of direct deposits these days. It's a lot easier for folks, but we just didn't have the motivation to do that because the physical check allowed us to check and balance about who received what, who picked up what, and when. And so I think those are the types of things that we're going to be challenged by as we engage with folks. Um, COVID-19, we did about $6.4 million in grants last year related to COVID-19. Some state and federal dollars, a lot of philanthropic resources, um, but most of it was making sure that people get what they need. There was this fundamental belief that we're only at our best as a community if everyone has what they need to succeed. That means that we need to be thoughtful about how we get information out, how we share information, how do we receive information, how do we connect with community in authentic ways? How do we meet people where they are in a virtual world? How do we make sure that seniors have access to information that they didn't have access to before? Are we going out like we did during the census with iPads and making sure that we're connecting with folks to make sure that they have access to testing or access to vaccines, right? And so all of that is a change in the way we are, but it was all kind of, it was all sparked by a negative quite frankly, global health pandemic. And so there are some things that we're going to take out of 2022, out of 2020 and take forward. I think one question we had to ask ourselves was, what are we willing to compromise about who we are and the comforts of the space that we occupy to get where we're trying to go, a more equitable or more inclusive community? And those are questions that at the Community Foundation we're wrestling with every day. What is it that we're willing to compromise about who we are and the comforts that we have today to ensure that this community is what it needs to be moving forward? And so we're on a journey. I hope that everyone's on a similar journey, but the reality is we don't have the answer. But again, full circle, what we've decided is that we're not trying to get back to normal. We're trying to co-create a new normal that works for more people than, than, the, than the formal normal did. Yeah, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. And I know we're starting to get to our, our time um, for the panel today. But um, with you saying that, are, do you all have any kind of final thoughts or advice for people who maybe are just stepping into this work of advocacy and now they're stepping into it in a, in a time and place that looks very different than maybe what they were expecting? Um, one thing I think is that we have to be open for innovation. I think that, I think Isaiah spoke to this, creativity. We don't know what needs are going to be, right? We don't know uh, all the pieces, right? So be open to listen to community, listen to the needs. And, you know, basically, I think, you know, as we're, we've been forced to be innovative and we, we have to continue to be in that way. And I think co-create is the right term. We all need to be a part of that co-creation of that normal that we, that we have. No one wants, one thing we know uh, that the crisis really put a light on stuff we already knew was happening, right? So no one's going to go back to what that was before. And so how do we, how do we, how do we push that and make sure that, 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 that that's the, um, what happens. And so I think that make sure we understand the creativity and make sure we understand that um, we need to all be part of that co-creation. Yeah, okay. thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Um, I would say uh, that we need to be comfortable in our discomfort. Um, and we need to be like ourselves, we need to be access accessible. And so when you find out that something is not accessible to somebody, then you need to like be that person to help make that accessible for that person. Whether it's, you know, putting captions on your Zoom or moving over to Google Meets because Google Meets has a better caption option than Zoom does right now. Or, <clears throat> excuse me, or like, you know, like just like any accessibility, I always think about the deaf and hard of hearing community, 
because I feel like this virtual world and, you know, with the masks and everything has made it um, very challenging for them. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, like how do we make ourselves accessible? And then how do we sit in that discomfort? Like it's okay to be uncomfortable as long as we're, we're moving toward, um, moving toward comfort. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And Quincy, I know your camera's off, so I don't know if you're still, if you're available, but um, be curious to hear if you have any thoughts or any final pieces of advice, uh, especially for folks who are are here trying to get neighborhood groups started. Um, it's definitely a different kind of world than maybe what uh, it was when they first had the idea to get started doing work that's very similar to what you're doing, you know, there at the beginning. Um, yeah, um, I'll wrap up right quick. Um, some of the things that I was just sitting here um, writing down is um, be willing to think outside of the box with this new um, way of um, doing business and meeting. Um, be teachable. Um, be willing to take constructive criticism. Um, be a problem solver. Um, I'm really, really high into energy. So um, when you're focused on the work at hand, whether it's going to meetings, whether it's working with a project, um, dealing with people, um, make sure that you don't um, dwell or get caught up in um, people in your ear with negative um, thoughts about why things can't work. Always stay focused. If you got the vision, we have the vision. Um, God created us to do his will out here, whether it's um, putting together meetings, doing cleanups, um, teaching, uh, facilitating Zoom meetings in the bedroom <laughs> with the dogs on the bed. But uh, whatever it is, just stay focused. Um, do w- what you need to do to get the job done. And I think everything will come in place. So um, that's my advice to anybody that's out there trying to do anything. Um, the race is not given to the swift or the strong, but to those who endure to the end. It may be hard right now, but it's going to get better as we go along. We're going to be able to get on this Zoom meeting. And I guess I pushed the wrong button. So my video went out. You know, I'm trying to get technology savvy right here. So give me a little time. Next time I do this, it'll be a little bit more better. You won't see no big old plant in the background. Maybe you can see <laughs> some lawnmowers or something, you know. So, yeah, that's Thank that's you it. so much. Thank you guys so much. That is just. Wow. So really quickly, if you don't mind, one, I, th- I feel like we should be passing a hat right now after Quincy just said that. Um, I feel like he was going to go right into opening the doors of the church. Just <laughs> whatever, whatever. <laughs> I, love it. <laughs> I know pass the, basket, so, pass the basket. I know that was probably my wrap up the last time, but I'm going to add three to seven. No, I'm going to add a couple. <laughs> things. I'm going to add a couple of things. One, I just just one recommendation is that people take advantage of the moment. Right. I'm going to summer like I've never summered before. Once these doors are open and we can get outside and get engaged in our neighborhoods, it's going to be an opportunity unlike what 2020 offered. 2020, we were a little afraid. We weren't sure what it meant to be outside. We thought the end of this was going to come in the fall. We didn't take advantage of full outside. And I think that's something I just recommend people do. Connect with Neighborhood Engagement Hub. Connect with Quincy. Connect with the folks with Karma. Flint Neighborhoods United. Connect with folks that are going to get outside and get it done. I'll I'll tell you, in Flint and probably across the country, we're going to summer like we've never summered before. Um, The second thing that I would say is just I was talking to someone recently and they said um, I was saying to them because I'm so smart. I was telling them, hey, um, there's this there's this belief that you we owe one another something. Right. And this and there's also this belief. So beyond just the belief that we owe one another something, there's this belief that um, people don't know what they don't know. And so we owe one another engagement in that conversation. And I said, we don't know what we don't know. And the person said, that's not the problem, Isaiah. The problem is that we assume we know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And I had to spend some time thinking about that. And I realized that, you know what, the only way to address that is to get more proximate, right? There's power in proximity. There's power in being close. And so Lynn would always remind us that there is a narrative that is thread through our community. 
There's a local narrative, there's a state narrative, there's a federal narrative about our engagement with our communities, why we live there, how we got there. We've got to figure out how to get proximate with the narratives that exist in our community. That way we're not just filling gaps or making assumptions about what we know. We're engaging with folks who understand those stories intimately and allowing those people to be part of the solutions, right? And so you're not doing two and four people, you're doing with them, or you're doing with them because they know their stories better than you ever could. And there's power in that proximity. And so the goal for me, for our organization, and hopefully for you all is that we begin to get more proximate with one another. We're gonna summer like we've never summer before. And we're not gonna make assumptions about the gaps that we have in our learning. And I'm just thankful for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, we got a happy belated birthday. No, 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 no. I'm still 39. <laughs> My birthday is on, fr on, on Saturday. I said Friday. It's on Saturday, April 3rd. But thank you so much. I appreciate it. Happy birthday. Happy upcoming birthday. <laughs> yeah. The 10th anniversary of my 30th birthday, Quincy. It's okay. coming up. I like that. 30, 30 and holding. holding. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I am going to let Michael kind of walk us through these post questions again, but I wanted to say thank you so much to our panelists. We really appreciate it. Um, if any of you want to hang out for a little bit, I'm sure people will be in the chat. We'll, we'll be talking about how do you design an advocacy campaign after this. Um, and I will uh, uh, allow Michael to kind of walk us through these post questions. Um, since he knows how to manage that better than me. <laughs> But for all of our participants, uh, I hopefully this was, uh, I don't know if this was the best pre and post questions to ask, but we'll, we'll see <laughs> how you guys feel about things now that we've had this conversation. Thank you all so much. Okay. All right, so um, as I mentioned before, we're just uh, asking these pre and post questions to help get a better sense of, uh, of how the session went. So. Um, for anybody who wasn't uh, wasn't with us at the start, it looks like we have quite a few folks who joined after. Um, this is a easy way to respond just by either texting uh, your response in. You can text the word COF community to the number 22333. Uh, and then once you send that text in, you'll get a response saying you were good to go. Otherwise, you can uh, open up a new web browser window and enter the URL wholeev.com slash COF community, uh, and that URL will be in the chat. Um, so the post question is, how familiar are you with navigating civic engagement processes and systems during COVID-19? If you are very familiar, that is the letter A. If you are familiar, that's B. If you're not sure, that is C. Unfamiliar is D. And if you are very unfamiliar still, <laughs> with how to navigate civic engagement processes and systems during COVID-19. That is letter E. And we're getting quite a few responses here. So let's go ahead and see that. All right. Beautiful. I'd say this is just about a uh, an exact inversion, I think. Um, Yay. We had almost everybody very unfamiliar before. Uh, now we are we are all, almost all, not sure familiar. So. Good to know. Awesome. Thank awesome. you, everyone, for answering that.